Designing for the web presents a different set of circumstances than designing for print. And of course the web is constantly evolving and so what you need to know before you design and build your website is always changing. But there's just a few things that you should keep in mind regardless of what style you're designing for that will assist you in creating graphics that can be easily translated to the web. Now the first thing I want to mention is type. When you're working with type, you typically want to use what are called web safe fonts in your layouts. Web safe fonts are the fonts that will most likely be found on anybody's computer regardless of what platform they're using, the two most popular being Mac and PC. So for instance, Verdana and Arial are web safe fonts as is Times New Roman and Georgia. So if you're specking or using web safe fonts in your layout, there's a good chance you could use them on your website and most people will have those fonts on their systems and be able to see your site the way you designed it. Recently, however, there's been a big shift to using other kinds of fonts. There's Adobe Typekit, there's also Google Fonts, which gives you the freedom to use other fonts on your website. For instance, with Google Fonts, and you could just type in Google Fonts to get to that website on Google Search Engine, you can use any font that you like. You can even download a font to use in your web mockup, and then of course use it by specifying it in the cascading style sheets for your website while you're building it. And the Google Fonts website has all the code for you, so you don't have to memorize anything. Just download the files for the font so that you can put it in your mockup. Now we used to always put our type in without any anti-aliasing turned on because different browsers would render your fonts in a different way. So let's zoom in a little bit to the type here at the top. And we will select that type with our cursor. Now also notice uh, at the top of the screen there's this option called auto select. Usually when you first launch Photoshop auto select is turned off and the option is set to group. I like to turn it on and change the option to layer so that with my black arrow, my move tool, I can click on any object and that layer will automatically be selected. So if I click on this type, then that type layer is selected for me. So you can see that the type has jagged edges and that's because the anti-aliasing is turned off for this layer. And as I was saying, text used to be rendered differently on different browsers. So for instance, if you were using an old version of Internet Explorer, and then you used a newer version of Safari, the font on Safari would look much nicer, cleaner, crisper, because it had a newer rendering engine, which would give you the nice smooth letter shapes. Now, probably in the last couple of years, I would say, most browsers have improved their rendering engines, so you no longer need to work with fonts that do not have anti-aliasing turned on. So what I would do in this case is turn it on to one of these options, sharp, crisp, strong, or smooth, depending on which one looks the best. Now I'm at 200%, so I might want to zoom back out to 100% to see what looks best based on this particular font that I'm using here. I want the one that's going to look cleanest and crispest with this particular font face. So probably that first one, sharp. Which one you use will depend on the font that you've selected because they render differently on screen. The next thing I want to talk about is working with placed art. So let's zoom back out again. And you notice that there's no logo here at the top left of the page. Usually logos are designed in vector programs like Adobe Illustrator because that gives you the flexibility to scale them up or down to any size for any purpose. So you would probably have your Illustrator artwork that you'd want to place a copy of into your document. You may not know what size it needs to be until you get it into your document and size it relative to the other objects in your layout. To place a image from another file like Illustrator, it will come in as a smart object, which means that it will retain all of its editable vector qualities, so you could scale it up and down without any loss of resolution, which is different from a regular image if you brought it in and you scaled it down and then tried to scale it back up again, it would look terrible. So bring it in by choosing File, Place, and I happen to have created an image for you in Illustrator, which is just the logo. This Place PDF dialog box will come open, and you can choose whether to insert the page or just the image. And I just want the image, not the whole page, not a bunch of black areas around it. So I'll choose Image and click 
the image itself, then click OK, and the image comes in. So while the image has this bounding box around it, I can scale it, I can rotate it, get really big, I'm going to hold down my Shift key, I can make it really small, and when I hit Enter, let me just bring it back up, when I hit Enter, it will retain all of its vector qualities. Now I happen to have added it at the bottom of my Layers panel, so I would want to drag it all the way up to the top so that I can make sure it's on top of everything else when I drag it into position. Now that it's up there, if I needed to modify the size, I can do Command or Control T to bring up my bounding box if I needed to transform it in any way, and then move it into position. So for instance, I might want to use my left-right arrows to make the L line up with the H in how it works. Smart objects can be edited at any time by double-clicking on the thumbnail. It will ask you if you want to change the contents. When you click OK, it would launch the original application so that you could go in and make some changes. And when you save the file, that saved change would come back into your document with all of the updates. So for instance, if I wanted to change the color of any of these pieces, I could make some of the changes, save it, and come back out. But we're not going to make any of those changes right now. We're just going to go back into our layout. Another thing to keep in mind when you're working for the web is organization and spacing. A lot of times designers who are used to working in print will put things wherever they want and kind of go with this organic feel of where to place things. But on the web, organization is key. So what you'd want to do is make sure that things are evenly spaced and perfectly aligned unless you're doing it deliberately and intentionally. So for instance, if we look at the navigation bar in this particular layout, you can see that the space to the left and to the right of each button on the navigation bar has a general sense of equal weight. And if you wanted to, you could use your rectangular marquee to measure the space and ensure that the space is exactly the same on both sides of any guides that you may have. Speaking of guides, it's a really great idea to turn your rulers on while you're working and work with guides so that you can place things evenly and consistently throughout your layout. You can view and turn on your rulers and your guides through the View menu. So Show Rulers, and that's a toggle on and off with the keyboard shortcut. And then also with the guides, you can drag a guide into your layout at any time by clicking and dragging from the top or left ruler and releasing inside the workspace. Now I had already applied a bunch of guides, so I'm going to remove that guide by dragging it off the board back into the ruler. So you can see that I've used guides to separate the different pieces within my layout. So I have a guide for the baseline of this text. I have a guide on the right side so that I can make sure that all of my text that flows within the header area is perfectly aligned to the right. And if you use guides, your selected layers will actually snap to them. Another thing I did was I have these boxes along the right sidebar and the boxes snap perfectly to the guides. There's even space between the outer edges of the layout on both sides and even space here. So that really helps you in creating an organized, perfectly thought out layout. You could also use some of the alignment and distribution tools to make sure that things are nice and even. So for instance, if I have request a quote, newsletter sign up, and how it works, and I might want to make sure that all three of those layers are aligned together. So what I would do is click on one first, control click on the next, and then control click on the third so that I can have them even though they're not touching. Shift clicking would only get everything in between, but control clicking will allow you to select things that aren't touching next to each other. And once you have two or more layers selected, you can use your alignment tools to make sure that things are nice and even. So if I wanted to make sure that the left edges of those three layers were evenly aligned, I click on that button and now they all have the same left alignment. Furthermore, I can make sure that they're equally distributed from top to bottom by distributing their top or their bottom edges, like so. Now, I might not like that exactly, so what I would do instead would maybe be to select one of the layers and move the text up roughly into the same position that I would want it to be. And I'm holding down my Shift key while I'm moving it so that the left edges stay in the alignment that they were before. Then I'll reselect them, and then I can do top alignment distribution. And this would probably ensure that the top area between 
the top edge of the box and the top edge of the text for each of the three boxes is even from box to box to box. Another thing that you really want to do when you're working for the web is organize your layers panel. And believe me, if you don't have an organized layer panel, it's really difficult to go in and make changes. And especially if you'll be sharing your Photoshop file with someone else in a team situation or even with your client, though I probably wouldn't give a Photoshop file for a web to a client, you want to make sure that your layers panel is organized because that reflects the kind of designer that you are. So even if you're really a messy person, it doesn't take that much effort to go in and clean up your layers panel. What I mean by cleaning it up is to organize into separate folders. So as you can see, I've created separate folders for the different sections of this particular layout. There's a section for the header, which is this area at the top. There's a section for the navigation bar. There's a section for the body and also a section for the footer. And let's look at the navigation area. The things that would go inside that particular folder are all the elements that I've used. Like these are the little lines, these little nav widgets between them. There's the text and then there's a gradient effect, three actual gradient effects that determine how that whole nav bar looks. So I've put all those pieces together in one folder, which means that I can toggle them on and off. I could lock them down and I have them in the order that they fall from top to bottom, which really makes it neat and organized for me when I'm working. Then I can expand and collapse these folders in my layers panel at any time. And it just makes me look like a nice, clean, organized designer. So now I have this logo, this place logo here. I would probably want to bring it into my header folder so that it's not just hanging out there. So it looks like it's really neat and organized. Now notice that when I dragged it into that folder, this is something that just happens automatically. When you drag something into a new folder, it usually throws that object at the very bottom. If I want it at the very top, I'll just have to click and drag and bring it to the top of that folder above everything else for it to appear. The last thing I want to mention about designing for the web is that you need to think about how you can recreate this design in HTML and cascading style sheets. So for instance, this black area up at the top can just be a single container with a black background color. And the only thing inside of that container is a little bit of HTML text. So I wouldn't need to use any graphics at all. In the header area, I would need a graphic for the logo. And maybe if I wanted to use a specific font, I would use this tagline as a graphic. But for call today and the 800 number, I would want to use HTML text and the background could be a background color. It doesn't have to be an image. Similarly, for the navigation, I would want to use HTML text, you know, you know, some kind of web safe font or a Google font that I'm assured that most people would be able to access and see so that there's consistent viewing from device to device and person to person. So the text would be in some kind of web safe font, like I say. The background, however, could be two images, one image, and it could just be a little sliver of an image for the normal state and then another image with slightly different coloration for the overstate. And I can use cascading style sheets to change the background image during normal and hover so that I have that rollover effect without having to resort to using JavaScript. Same goes for the body area. You know, maybe I don't even need a graphic for these sidebar boxes. I could just create a container with a white background and a fine one point stroke in light gray. My button graphic would probably be a graphic, but I could put HTML text on top of it. So I'm thinking ahead about how I would build this. And typically you would want to design something that you can build. Or if you're not going to be the person who is building it, speak to the person who will be building it, some kind of front end developer or a programmer, so that you can ensure that that person will be able to build your design. You wouldn't want to create something that's so outrageous that it would be difficult to implement. So keep all of these things in mind while you're designing and you'll have great success converting your mock-up into an actual website.